the essence of this message is that God brought Pharaoh into the world and moved in his life and controlled his life so that God would be glorified and his name would be proclaimed forever, everywhere. Rahab, a couple countries over, heard that, that what God had done to the Egyptians. And so his name was being broadcast. And God did what he did to, to Pharaoh so that Rahab would hear and become a believer. He was in charge of all this, so his name would be broadcast. Do I say the word Pharaoh funny? I was talking to my dad last night, and he says, what are you preaching on tomorrow? And I said, well, I'm talking a little bit about Pharaoh. And he goes, who? <laughs> you know, that guy that went up against Moses, Pharaoh. You know, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. What? <laughs> and he finally goes, oh, Pharaoh. Isn't that the word I've been using? I can, uh, so I'm wondering, I, I really had doubts about how I said that word today. <laughs> Pharaoh was raised up to a, what are you saying over here? Oh, what is German for Pharaoh? Well, what's German with a French accent for Pharaoh? That's, that's really what my dad's accent is. I don't, Pharaoh A? Because he's Canadian. God, my dad has asked me to send these services to him, so he's going to hear this. I'm in really lots of trouble. There goes the inheritance. Can you edit this out? Anyway, God brought Pharaoh, raised him up, for his own purpose. It was because God chose to do it. Again, Moses, not Moses, Paul is emphasizing that God is in charge. God did, did this to display his name and his power throughout the world. Now, verse 18 summarizes God's freedom. It also summarizes uh, its impact on human beings in both a positive and a negative way. God works in Pharaoh shows that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he can harden whomever he wants. God is in charge, even of people's negative decisions. God is in charge. Now, the word harden refers to the fact that Pharaoh became insensitive to anything that God had to say. He became insensitive to, to God's pleading, to, to his, really his own son's death. He became insensitive to what God was doing in his world. And Paul goes on then to say that God is free to use his creatures as he wills. We'll get back to Pharaoh in a minute. Paul asserts that God's sovereignty means that he can do what he wants. And it also is going to bring up another question. And he goes on to answer that question. He says, when, then why does God still blame us? After all, who resists his will? If God is in charge of Pharaoh and making Pharaoh do bad things, then who can blame Pharaoh for what he did? How can he hold Pharaoh responsible for what he did? Now, again, we don't have the answer that we might expect. Uh, we get an answer that Paul thinks will meet our needs. Not a logical answer, but a historical answer. He offers no logical explanation. He just says, God is sovereign, human beings are free, and he doesn't bother to make those two fit together. Frankly, that doesn't bother me. It might bother you that I have a conundrum in my logical thinking, that I believe in two impossible things in one day. Um, but that doesn't bother me because I believe that God is bigger than me. If I understood everything about God that there was to understand, then I would be God, and you guys would have to worship me. Uh, let's not go there. I don't understand everything about God. You know, God explains most things, and most things fall into place logically. But there are a few places in, in things that we believe that are only going to be resolved in the mind of God. Paul doesn't suggest, Paul doesn't bother to, to solve that problem of how free will and sovereignty can go together. He just states that both are true. He just states that both are true. Human, God's will uh, is not based on human decisions. He goes on to reaffirm that that God is in control. He goes full speed ahead with this idea that God is in control. He doesn't bother to, to explain how they fit together. He just says that God has got the freedom to do what he wants. And he reminds us of this through this idea that we are pots, that God is the potter and we are the clay. What right does a creative being, a pot, have to tell the potter, the creator, what to do? Now, 
he uses this image of the potter and the clay. And it's been used a lot in the Old Testament for various reasons and in various places. The parallel is not perfect. Okay, we are not clay. Now, it is true that you are what you eat. And most of us, when we were young, ate a lot of dirt. So I guess we could be clay. But it falls down in a lot of places. It lines up in one very important place. And that is, it is God's right to do what he wants. You know, we're not clay, but it is God's right to do what he wants in this world. He's God. He's sovereign. Now, in a world in our country where we believe in people's freedom and our autonomy and our, our, willing, our freedom to do what we want, we have a problem with kings, you know, and rightly so. But we still have the king of the universe, and we have to deal with him. He has the right to do what he wants. And Paul says that he creates some vessels for honor and some for dishonor. In other places, this, this idea is used uh, for the giftedness that people have. Some people have great gifts of, of evangelism, like Billy Graham, and, and they're honored all over the world. Some people have no gifts at all and, and, uh, and uh, receive very little honor in this world. God says, in that case, everybody's equal because they're all from God and everybody's fine. But here he's talking about salvation. He's saying that some vessels are created for salvation and some vessels are not going to make it to heaven. Paul is thinking of God's freedom to choose some people to be saved. And we'll talk about the other half of that in just a minute as well. Then there's a final complicated question. I, I don't know where this stop sign is, but really I, I, it just intrigues me. Uh, this one says you can't go left. This one says you can't go right. This one says you can't go backwards. And this one says you can't go forwards. I live there a lot, I think. There's a complicated question going on here. Uh, and, the, and the first thing that we, we need to understand is there's really not an answer given. In fact, in the NIV, it, 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 puts that, it puts that hyphen in there to show that this is sort of a rhetorical question and there really isn't an answer. Um, the second thing that we need to decide in, this, in, this, in these two verses is what does it mean by choosing? And I believe that this means that God causes things to happen. You know, dominoes. One domino hits another, it causes things to happen. And so we end up with this idea that because God wants publicly to display his wrath and power, he has been patient with sinful people. He goes on in verse 23 to say that there's a, a bigger purpose, and that purpose is to show believers, the people that he has mercy to, that he's giving mercy to, so that they will understand just how merciful God has been to them. It's going to be even a bigger show when God finally displays his wrath because then everyone who's had mercy shown to them will really understand what God has done for us. Behind these two verses is a Jewish tradition that says that God is, is not punishing the nations. God is not punishing the people that punished Israel because he just wants to make a bigger show at the end. Uh, and it was a common thought. And, and Paul builds on that and says, yes, God is waiting till the end and letting sin go because he wants to have, uh, uh, show us more about what his mercy is all about. We need to talk about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Doesn't that look like Michael? Do you, you're Michael. Doesn't this look like Michael Kank? Is Michael back there? Yeah, and the eyes, really. That's Michael's eyes. Michael, I think you got some Pharaoh blood in you somewhere. Uh, we won't talk about Michael's hardening of his heart. We'll talk about Pharaoh in the Bible. He'll, he'll want you to bow down now, is that? He'll want you to kill the firstborn son? Probably. Luke just like, whoa now. Let's talk about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. It says in Romans that God hardens whom he wants to harden. And frankly, this is one of the most controversial statements in all of Scripture. Uh, I don't know what you want to put ahead of it, but really this is, this is a place where we're going to have problems. God hardens whom he wants to harden. Moses refers to the hardening of Pharaoh's heart 20 times in 10 chapters, uh, back in the book of Exodus. What is particularly important is to, is to look at the interplay, the interaction between God's hardening and Pharaoh's hardening 
uh, as you read through, through the book of Exodus.